So it's been a hectic few weeks, but very exciting, and that's because I've been moving house. And this is the new kitchen in our house. And as you can see, we're going to be celebrating later on tonight because it's the first weekend we've spent here. And there's only one thing to do for celebrating a big event like this, and that's a good bottle of champagne. And so we're going to be having some friends over later, and we're going to be drinking this. Right guys, who wants some champagne? Yay! Is that the magic word? <laughs> Are you sure? I didn't reply to Facebook eventually, and then you said, Are you sure you're Yes, yes, I do! <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, I'm a pleasure to text on Facebook, yes, yes. Woo! Hey. Hey. Yeah. You're not the one in the event, John, bro. You're the character of the Shut up. <laughs> So let's start with the controversial bit. Champagne was discovered and invented by an Englishman, Christopher Merritt, in 1662. He published a paper with the Royal Society which basically outlined the method champagne was, although it wasn't called that, for making sparkling wine. In fermentation, yeast is added to the sugar present naturally within the grapes, and the yeast helps convert this sugar through into alcohol. Overall here, you're looking at the reaction for the fermentation of glucose, and you can see that a molecule of glucose is converted into two molecules of ethanol and two molecules of carbon dioxide. In actual fact, fermentation isn't a single step, simple process like I've shown it there. And one of the things that you should do if you're a chemist is find out the steps involved in the fermentation process and what the intermediates are. And we'll be looking at that in the video that accompanies this one. It's also worth thinking about what the oxidation number is of each carbon within those structures. So that's the fermentation process. Glucose converted into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And normally you make wine in a big vat, the sugar in the grapes ferments to form the ethanol, and the carbon dioxide is simply given off to the atmosphere. What Christopher Merritt realised is that if you added additional sugar after you'd fermented the wine, an extra yeast, a second fermentation would take place. Furthermore, if this second fermentation was done in a sealed container, the carbon dioxide that was generated by the process would become trapped within the wine. And this was of course done in France in the Champagne region. Being in the north of France, they didn't have so much sugar naturally occurring within the grape because it doesn't ripen for so long in the north of France, but they could add extra sugar, get a second fermentation, and hence boost the alcohol content of their wine. So it took relatively poor grapes and turned them into a good, effective wine. Most of the early attempts at making sparkling wines get very sweet wines. A lot of sugar would be added in that second fermentation and the wine would be further sweetened for the palate. But it was in 1846 that Perrier Jouet first made a real brut champagne drink. And the designation brut depends on how much sugar you add to the wine. If you're adding less than six grams per litre, for the second fermentation, the wine you will end up with will be brute or dry wine. And the more sugar you add, the sweeter the wine becomes. And a true sweet champagne would add up to 50 grams of sugar per litre in that second fermentation. So it was in 1891 that the designation champagne became legally protected by the Treaty of Madrid, which meant you were not able to make a sparkling wine in the UK and call it champagne, or in fact anywhere else in the world. Even in Switzerland, famously, there's a village called Champagne, but they cannot designate the wine they make as wine of champagne or champagne wine because it's a protected trademarked name. Interesting, the marketing of champagne has perhaps been one of the biggest geniuses, and it was in the 1890s that this really kicked off. Interestingly, a similar time to when Coca-Cola was being marketed in the USA. This was an era of the first 
phase of capitalism, consumerism, and champagne was marketed as a drink for the wealthy. Kings across Europe were known to enjoy champagne and this was marketed very heavily and champagne became associated with celebrations and it became a drink of the middle and the upper classes. Interestingly, champagne was a drink that was also always marketed very strongly towards female drinkers, unlike the traditional red wines, the clarets and the Bordeaux, and this opened up the market. A further way of associating champagne with luxury was to get Formula One drivers to receive champagne when they won their races. And it was in 1967, in the Le Mans 24-hour race, that the tradition of spraying the bottle of champagne started amongst racing drivers. And this helped seal the image of this drink as one of high rollers, luxury and celebration. And this is how champagne makes its money, and this is why they can charge so much for the wine that they produce. It's interesting to note that having been invented originally by an Englishman, some of the very best sparkling champagne type wines are now being produced in England. Kent, for example, has the perfect chalky soil, very similar to the Champagne region, and is now making Champagne-style wines that are winning international competitions against their French competitors. What does your body do when it takes in that alcohol? How do you cope with the Champagne that you drink? Ethanol is a psychoactive component. It acts on GABA receptors in the brain, and that's why it has this effect of making you feel tipsy. If you get up to 0.05% blood alcohol content, you'll become talkative, you'll become a little bit um, relaxed and euphoric. You only need to get to 10 times that dose, 0.5% blood alcohol content, and it'll kill you. And the various effects of alcohol on your body lie within that range. A single drink will take you up to about 0.05% blood alcohol content. As you increase the amount of alcohol in your bloodstream, then it has more of an effect. You get to about 0.3% blood alcohol content, you're likely to pass out. 0.4% is about where the risk of death becomes, and much over 0.5%, and you're pretty sure to die because of alcohol poisoning. Your body is filled with enzymes that help you deal with everything that you eat, everything that you consume. And for ethanol, it's no different at all. And the first reaction is done by the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. And if we look at the reaction that alcohol dehydrogenase carries out, it converts ethanol into ethanol. And again, if you're a chemist, think about the oxidation levels of the carbon atoms in those molecules. Actually, ethanol is very toxic to your body. It's a very reactive compound. It's the fact that the ethanol gets converted to ethanol that leads to the liver toxicity and the kidney toxicity. You mainly have your alcohol dehydrogenase within your liver and your kidney, and this is why ethanol damages your liver and kidney, because you get a buildup of ethanol within your liver and kidney. And so there's another enzyme that follows on from alcohol dehydrogenase that desperately tries to get rid of the ethanol. And we're looking at the chemical process here, and it's the conversion of ethanol into ethanoic acid, or acetic acid, or vinegar, as it's otherwise known. Again, think about the oxidation number of the carbons in those compounds. Of course, the more you drink, the more of these enzymes you have, the more effective they become in breaking down the ethanol and the ethanol. And that's why heavy drinkers become able to drink more alcohol because their enzymes become more efficient at processing the alcohol. Anyway, once you've turned ethanol into ethanoic acid, that can quite easily be excreted by the body in the urine. Again, if you're a chemist, you might like to think why that is. There is a final process that can occur, which is the conversion of ethanoic acid into water and carbon dioxide. But more normally, the ethanoic acid simply gets rapidly excreted in the urine, and basically, that's where your champagne ends up. You drink that nice glass of champagne, and it ends up as vinegar going down the toilet. <laughs>